Hello there. I'm lying down today. I am a person with postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or POTS, which basically means that nothing works correctly and I'm exhausted all the time. And there are certain factors that can make it worse. For example, having a bunch of bright lights pointed in your face all at the same time. Therefore, lying down. It's been pretty hard to get anything done, and generally the cure for that as a person who makes YouTube videos is just to talk about whatever you want. And today, that's Polly Pocket. This will be an emotionally driven, opinionated, and slightly disjointed look at the overall franchise, but mostly the eras that I grew up with. Because I make the rules around here, baby! But first I would like to thank- Hello. Let me tell you about Cool Shirts. Cool Shirts is a cool company that sells cool clothes. The fact of the matter is, if I'm wearing Cool Shirts, I have a better day. Why? Because Cool Shirts clothes are extremely fun, and when you look fun, you feel fun. And I hear you, potential customer, you say, but what about the quality? Cool Shirts clothes are built to last. They use strong and sensory-friendly material, and the craftsmanship is top-notch. You'll be wearing your Cool Shirt for a good long time. Today, I'm wearing the new Log Off tee, which serves as a reminder that social media dissolves your brain like sulfuric acid, and the only cure is to stop posting, stop scrolling, and just do anything else. If you're having a hard time staying unplugged, this fun retro-style graphic tee will remind you to slap your phone directly out of your own hand. You can visit Cool Shirts using the link in my description, and please, I beg of you, use code LeeSpeaks for 10% off. Let me first define what my understanding of Polly Pocket is. This girl has gone through several redesigns over the years, but I am only personally familiar with two of them. That is the original compact Polly Pocket and the original three and three quarter inch fashion Polly. Two major resources I used to figure out the timelines of these toys were OnlyPollyPocket.com and FakeySpaceMan.com, which host extensive catalogs of the 1989 to 2002 miniature Polly Pockets and the post-1998 fashion Pollies, respectively. I love how retro toy collector guides tend to have an equally retro web aesthetic. I appreciate their dedication to preserving the look of Web 1.0. I ended up owning a fair amount of millennial toys growing up due to having two much older sisters, and compact Pollies were one of them. I really can't overstate my love for these toys. These compacts are beautifully designed. I would just stare at them for so long, taking in all their details, especially the star-shaped compact, which I honestly think is one of the most beautiful toys in the world. I'm not kidding when I say these toys are such a formative memory that the environments I see in dreams are often inspired by the Polly Pocket compacts. The thing about this era of Polly Pocket, however, is that it kind of deprioritizes Polly herself. She's so small, so minuscule, so easy to lose, and her face is barely there. She is not the centerpiece of the toy, the environment is. The larger playsets were even more incredible. One of them had a magnet inside and a special magnetic bottom poly, so she would glide around this town when you turned a crank. This play feature was sadly rendered unusable if you lost the special magnetic bottom poly, which I unfortunately did. The houses were also excellent. The intricacy and craftsmanship were outmatched by any other toy that I owned, including the Polly Pocket playsets from the 2000s. The level of interactivity is extremely engaging. In some of these playsets, it seems like every little nook and cranny has its own special interaction. A good example of this is this playset known as the Magical Mansion. Not only did the rooms serve different purposes depending on whether they were in the up or down position, there was a ballroom Polly's could dance around lit by glowing statues, there was a triple layered portion on the right side and the bottom is a stable with a horse and carriage, there was a garage that ejected a car out at breakneck speed. Amazing. In this era, we also begin to see some cool transforming vehicles, which is a theme that the brand would stick to for a good long while. This Polly didn't exactly have the most consistent face due to the tiny size of the toys. But there was a mascot version of the character, which you could see on the packaging. The only other Polly Pocket media that I could find from this era were a handful of picture books. This Polly was created while the IP was owned by Bluebird Toys, a company that would ultimately come to be acquired by Mattel, which would proceed to overhaul the brand, creating a new version of the toys called Fashion Polly. So, as some of you may have noticed, the majority of the pictures I've been using from this segment have been from Etsy and eBay, since marketing photographs tend to have the highest quality imagery of these toys. And while I was scrolling there and saving pictures, I encountered something that I didn't encounter even once while I was doing research. Lucy Lockett. 
At first, I was like, oh my gosh, it's a bootleg, and with a particularly bold name and logo choice. But no, upon closer inspection, these were made by Bluebird. Lucy Lockett was a small doll with brushable hair, fabric clothes, and compacts and playsets that were highly reminiscent of Polly Pocket, but scaled up. I was surprised I didn't see any information about her on OnlyPollyPocket.com, but that turns out it's because she's way at the bottom of the other section, and there isn't that much information here either. It seems like there was only one release of these toys before they were retired with little fanfare. Lucy is consistently described in these catalogs as Polly's grown-up friend. She's also seen walking around with Polly, appropriately, inside her pocket. Is this how aging works in the Bluebird Polly Pocket universe? They're just born tiny and grow in scale? Is Polly Pocket a baby? Is Lucy an adult? Are they peers and Lucy is just kaiju-sized for no particular reason? How does this work? I don't think they attempted to connect the two sizes of dolls in any other generation, because honestly it's just a little bizarre. I'm not the biggest fan of these dolls, but I think their associated playsets have all the charm of the usual Polly Pocket houses and playsets. While this initial attempt at larger dolls seemed to have been a flop, it may have set the groundwork for the fashion polys that we see starting in 1998. There was kind of an in-between period from 1998 to 2002 where they were selling both the compacts and fashion polys at the same time. They had some pretty cool play sets from this time for both sizes of the dolls, and the miniature polys became much more intricately detailed during this time. The logo during this period, however, it's definitely an awkward middle phase between two much stronger logos. But this phase wouldn't last forever. It was time for Polly to properly establish herself as a character. I'd like to take a moment to highlight Jerry Livingston, who was responsible for so much of the iconic imagery for Mattel during this time period, including Polly Pocket and Barbie. I love Love, 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 love this art style. It's so early 2000s, it's so slick and fun, and I know it's not a competition, but I think this is the most iconic version of Polly herself. The way this style is adapted into animation is also extremely charming. Well, w with one exception. In Polly World, they're faithful to the marketing images as far as using round, doll-like eyes, which honestly doesn't translate so well into animation. I think the Pocket Plaza stylization works a little bit better. Everyone gets almond-shaped eyes instead, which I think comes off as less of a disconcerting stare. I'm a little sad that I don't have many physical props for this segment, because I think I received Polly Pocket more than any other type of doll over the years. And I had a couple of the larger playsets too. But all that remains is a handful of dolls and this bed. The standard 2000s Polly Pocket stood a bit less than 4 inches in height and had 6 point of articulation, the limbs, head, and torso. Whether they had sculpted or brushable hair depended on the figure. Dolls with long hair tended to be brushable, while figures with short hair and most updos were sculpted. I think this is a pretty sensible choice for dolls of this size. And the clothes. Oh, the clothes. How I wish I had some Polly Pocket clothes to squish right about now. The clothes were made of this rubbery material that would slip onto the dolls, and while they were much more restrictive than fabric doll clothes, they were much easier for small, uncoordinated hands to grasp onto and play dress up with. And yes, we have to discuss the chewability. I'm not saying that everyone chewed on their Polly Pocket clothes, but I am saying it is very common to have chewed on your Polly Pocket clothes, and it may have been the majority experience. My own personal rationalization is that it both looks and feels like gum, and sometimes it was a little fruity scented, which just added to the allure. I didn't frequently chew on Polly Pocket clothes, but I did indulge every now and again. I am devastated to say that these clothes, while wonderful, have some pretty major longevity issues. If you've ever found some pleather that was sitting in a box untouched for a decade, you probably know what I'm talking about. When you pull it out, it looks okay, until you try to take it on or off of a doll in which it just falls apart in your hands. I only have one poly left that has any stretch clothes and they're in pretty bad shape. If I try to move it at all, the splitting will only become worse. I've had trouble finding discussion about this issue from other toy collectors, but I can't imagine I'm the only one who's experienced this problem. If you'd like to try to buy some Polly Pocket from this era, do be warned that dress up may be off the table if the clothes have disintegrated too much. It seems like there might be ways that the degradation can be prevented. It may help if they're stored in a temperature controlled and airtight space. 
The play sets, however, probably hold up just about as well as any other plastic toy. Every now and again, Polly would get fabric clothes. Since she's so small, these tend to not look as good as the stretch clothes and be a little more vulnerable to craftsmanship issues. However, these were probably the best option both for longevity and for the posability of the doll. Occasionally, the Polly clothes would use both types of material at the same time. There was one other style of clothes released during this time known as Quick Click. This was the rigid magnetic style. These clothes, while surely more durable, were even worse for doll maneuverability. The dolls weren't able to move at all while wearing these, or else the front and back halves would just snap apart. While these clothes were often integrated into the play sets in very interesting ways, these were obviously inferior to the other types of clothes. The quick click garments and play sets were later recalled because too many children swallowed the magnets, which just goes to show that there is absolutely nothing that will stop children from eating Polly Pocket clothes, even the crunchy variety. The play sets were probably the main draw during this time, and some of them were pretty awesome. I remember having two of them. First is the Snow Cool Hotel, a ski resort themed playset made of this extremely appealing translucent purple plastic. This playset had some fun interactions like a magnetic ice skating rink and a ski lift that dropped onto a slide. My other one was the Quick Click House of Style, which used the magnetic garments. These were integrated exceptionally well. You could place your intended outfit on the mannequin, load it up into the closet, and then when Polly goes down the elevator, boom, outfit change. Features like this were easily the best part of the Quick Click line to me. However, this was pretty much the only thing that I used the Quick Click Polly for, because it's just more useful to have the typical range of motion that the standard body type offers. They went all out for the toys related to Polly World, the in-universe theme park and real-world feature-length movie. This line included a tour bus, gift shop, costume cart, a combination limousine dressing room, and of course, the crown jewel, the theme park, complete with a roller coaster. The So Hip cruise ship is truly a magnificent beast. I'd love to have the kind of self-esteem to be willing to paint my face on the side of a gigantic boat. Speaking of fanciful modes of transportation, the groovy getaway jet was one that a few of my friends had and that I was extremely envious of. I love this chunky airplane. My one issue with it is that I wish the windshield was transparent and not this goofy-looking sticker. And my god, we have to talk about the cars! Polly Pocket has some of the coolest-looking doll cars in both miniature and fashion Polly size. The smaller cars were known as Polly Wheels, and while some of these look really nice, I don't think they were nearly as impressive as the fashion Polly cars. Almost all of these toys use some kind of transformation gimmick, like the helicopter, which as the name implies changes into a helicopter, or the limo that changes into a dressing room, or the limo that changes into a cooler limo. I remember that these were all pretty sturdy despite all their moving parts. Lately, I've kind of found myself orbiting around doll collector Twitter, and even though I'm not a doll collector myself, there's still a few things that draw me to this community. First, I learn new things about girly media all the time. From things I aged out of the target audience of by the time they were released, or things that had little to no online media and so I wasn't likely to learn about them, or obscure brands that just got very little attention in general. The second reason is, people are constantly fighting each other all the time. And when things are so dark and bleak in the real world, there's just something so refreshing about seeing people fight over something so low stakes. But you know what, babes? If it ever gets too real, you can just log off. But not before you visit Cool Shirts for some fun and comfortable clothes. And use code Lee Speaks for 10% off. However, there's a doll that I really barely see discussed there, and that is Polly Pocket. And my first thought was, well, maybe fashion doll collectors just aren't that interested in minis. And while that is kind of true, I think there's another reason why people my age don't necessarily remember this line so fondly. Let's just take a look at these doll lots. Do you notice anything in common? In retrospect, this era of Polly was extremely white to an alienating degree. Little girl media consumers are very likely to gravitate towards media that they can personally identify with. And it's really no wonder why a lot of people felt left out by Polly Pocket during this era. Shani plays the role of the only named black person in this universe and, well, is she voiced by a black woman? I'll give you a hint. No. If I recall correctly, Shawnee dolls were also pretty underrepresented in the play sets. The vast majority of my Polly Pockets came bundled with something larger, and that was usually the main draw. I remember having a couple Leahs and a few Lilas, but I don't remember having a Shawnee. And from the looks of these doll lots, she's awfully hard to find. 
For God's sake, it's easier to find figures with dark skin from the 90s. This seems like something they've tried to be more cognizant about in recent years. Most notably, they've shrunk the size of Polly's friend group to give Shawnee a larger role, and by extension, a much stronger presence in the merchandise. When I went to Target to check out how Polly Pocket is doing nowadays, Shawnee had a very significant presence in the toys. She was easy to find, she had her own designated playsets, and she was far from the only person of color. I'm happy that Shawnee got her flowers eventually, but man, looking back, it is staggering how much they did not give a sh about diversity in this period. And it's not like this tokenization issue is perfectly fixed either. Just check out these name lists. Polly, Lila, Shani, Margot, Bella, Unnamed Friend, Unnamed Friend, Unnamed Friend. I'm happy these characters are here, but I also wish that they had names. It just seems strange that despite all this diversity in the merchandise and the effort to characterize the other girls, Shawnee remains the only named black character in the toys. Next, let's talk about an aspect of Polly Pocket that was arguably more iconic than the toys during this generation. That is, the Polly Pocket section of EverythingGirl.com. Everything Girl was the site that Mattel used to host all its various girly properties like Barbie and Barbie Girls, My Scene, Pixel Chicks, and later on Monster High. Everything Girl is a website with an unfortunately large amount of lost media, but the actual mini games are largely saved. To play these games, I'm going to be using a mix of Flashpoint and Numuki. That's N-U-M-U-K-I. I'm just going to be looking at the 2000s era games because I'm biased. Polly herself greeted you when you clicked on the Polly Pocket section, which then expands into an interactive environment. I was able to find the home pages for the first and second versions of the website. The first version of this is a landscape with a limo, house and garden, mall, water park, and amusement park. When you first enter the page, you receive this introduction from Polly. Welcome to PollyPocket.com! Fantabulous games, sweet surprises, and tons of fun! Just the way I like it! Come on in! The second version expands this landscape into a more advanced, side-scrolling scene. The attractions are more or less the same, except for the jewel hunt and poly wheels options. This version uses a slightly different intro. Come to polypocket.com! We can hit them all, decorate my room, hang out at Polly World, and so much more! Come on in! I'm pretty confident that this Polly is not voiced by Tegan Moss, who provides the voices for the movies. Welcome to PollyPocket.com! My dad said I could bring anyone I wanted, so consider this your live invite. But I'm also not sure who this is, and I couldn't find any credits for the Flash games. I'm sad to say that, at least as far as the Wayback Machine goes, the individual pages that this homepage used to lead to are nearly all missing. But I can tell you that these buttons used to lead to themed rooms that contained whatever minigames were relevant to the theme. One of my personal favorites was Wacky Wardrobe. You select an outline, color, pattern, and accessory, and then hit the lever to see Polly in your combination. If you hit the random button, you'll get an outfit that can't be created with the presented options. What I can say for sure about these games? They sure love a very short audio loop and repetitive sound effects. They're passable as far as sound design goes, it's not like you tend to notice these things when you're a kid. But I remember getting annoyed at this repeated audio clip all the way back then. Ta -da! Lots of people pointed out to me that the Girls Go Games driving game that I looked at in my last video strongly resembles the game Party Pickup. While the claim that this is a ripoff is mostly accurate, I mean just look at them side to side, Girls Go Wheels has a much more bonkers control scheme. The controls for Party Pickup are up to go up, down to go down, right to go right, and left to go left, but for Girls Go Wheels it's up is forward, back is reverse, and steering is right and left. This makes Party Pickup a much easier game, as well as the fact that there aren't any other cars on the road. A different driving game that I actually did play was Drive in Style. There's something actually a little difficult about this game, despite the fact that it doesn't have a lose state. That is, it's pretty hard to make the outfit that you actually want. This limo is so large and wide that it just kind of tends to pick up everything in its path, and this gives you a very unintentional looking outfit at the end. It's kind of a bummer to be so close to finishing and then you end up with the wrong top at the very last second. This game is overtly an advertisement for the quick click limo scene. Another favorite was the Rockstar Makeover game. The gameplay section is a very simple dress up game with admittedly limited options, although I did think they were very glam at the time. But the main appeal is what happens whenever you click this next button. Bye. 
this song every time you finish the dress-up game, thus burning it into the minds of myself and my peers. There's no way I can finish this section without mentioning the beautiful bedroom game. Mattel had a couple different room makeover games for their various franchises, but this was easily my favorite. The options are just so fantastical and fun. Honestly, my interior design sensibility is still like this. I smiled fondly upon hearing this music loop at first, until I realized it was only five seconds long. I wouldn't like to get too deep into the Flash games right now, because I plan to when I take a look at the whole of EverythingGirl.com later on. In my opinion, Polly Pocket works particularly well in this Flash medium because the play styles of the Polly Pocket play sets in Flash games are very parallel. Both are a collection of specific interactions where you're rewarded for poking around and interacting with every possible thing. I always got the impression that the Polly Pocket section of the site was more tailored for younger users than other parts. These games tend to be unchallenging, unlosable, and generally very short and repetitive. However, the way this site was laid out was so interesting and immersive that I enjoyed it even a while after I'd stopped getting new Polly Pockets. That was until the 2010 rebrand happened, and boy, I was not welcoming of that change. Next, let us discuss the movies of Polly Pocket. Now, until about a week ago, I was under the impression that there were only two movies, Too Cool at the Pocket Plaza and Polly World. Turns out that the two in Too Cool is meant to represent that it's the sequel. The first one came out in 2004, a year before the second. Now, these first two are called movies, but in reality, they're just 22-minute episodes. First in the series is Polly Pocket Lunar Eclipse. I was surprised to see a different art style employed in this first movie. I'm honestly not sure how I feel about the look of Polly Pocket herself. I think the biggest mistake is that her hair is down. Polly is a ponytail girl. Alopecia representation. The movie opens on Polly Pocket giving a glowing review of the concept of Italy to her butler Samuel, who has a nickname that Polly consistently does not enunciate, and therefore I'm forced to assume it's Ass Man. We cut to her in her bedroom where she's styling an outfit for her friend Lila. Well, hold on, this is a different look for Lila. It seems like they attempted a little more diversity in the set of designs, and this alone. It's kind of a bummer that they backpedaled on that decision for the next two movies. Lila and Chrissy are so similar to each other in the other two movies that from a group character design perspective, it just makes sense to give one of them a different color palette. Except in this movie, Chrissy is named Anna. I'm curious what their vision for this set of designs was. This kind of has a TV pilot look and feel to it, and I'm wondering if they were planning to expand this into an animated series. Polly shows off her hologram fashion system, and their interaction is ended by Samuel making Polly go to bed and then selects an outfit from her clueless style closet before going to school. What up, Rochelle? Rochelle? Okay, there's a punk girl and her name is Rochelle. Does this mean she'll have a role in the episode? No. But we know she's Rochelle. We now get to see the rest of Polly's friend group, and while I personally think this look isn't the best for Polly, the bangs with a bite taken out of them are particularly questionable, I think everybody else looks so cute here. These designs are substantially more memorable than the ones we get in the next two movies. Every one of them has more personality implied just through their designs. They get assigned a class project about the upcoming lunar eclipse, and we get to see our first glimpse of the rival group, Beth, Tori, and Evie. Lila is paranoid about getting a bad grade, which would cause her to be grounded, which would cause their band to not be able to play at the school dance. Beth overhears this conversation and begins scheming. Lila laments that the lunar eclipse is happening on the wrong side of the world from them, but no worries, Polly is filthy rich and can just fly them all out there on a whim. This little throwaway line, I'll see you in Tokyo next week, kind of belies a sad reality about Polly's relationship with her father, which is that she sees him very rarely, and when she does, very briefly. Beth confronts Polly and accidentally trauma dumps on her. Unfortunately for me, who always comes in second, and then I have to explain to my parents who expect me to be number one and won't give me a break. And then gets mad at her polite response and literally gets mad at her for existing. I forget, what did Polly ever do to you? She exists? Then she gives Lila a sabotaged film camera under the assumption that it'll cause them to get a bad grade cut to Polly and her friends in a limo that just happens to be identical to the purchasable rock and pop stretch limo. I absolutely blame Polly Pocket for my childhood obsession with extremely impractical limousines. 
They fly over to her family's private island. Hey, my scene cameo. And then this happens. You are now free to dance about the cabin. They land on the island and Polly's dad surprises them with an entire water park. Just an entire full-scale staffed water park that no one else is able to use. Like, there is not a single soul on this island who is not Polly, one of her friends, or being paid to be there. They prepare to observe and photograph the eclipse when they notice a dolphin about to be stranded in a tide pool. Lila and Anna take care of documenting the eclipse on their own, while the other three go lead the dolphin back into the ocean. When they arrive back at school, Lila notices that the photos have been sabotaged. All of them are double exposed because Beth used an old roll of film. She prepares a speech about the eclipse to make up for the lost work, and they finish out their assignment by showing a bunch of paintings of the eclipse along with some music and disco lights. I'm not exactly sure what those last two elements added, but everyone is extremely impressed, including the teacher, who gives them an A+. The band performs at the dance, and Beth seethes about her plan not working out. Next in the series is the one that I actually had the DVD of, and that is Too Cool at Pocket Plaza. Honestly, going from the previous friend group to this one just sucks. The girls are so hard to tell apart, especially Lila and Chrissy. Like, what on earth were they thinking having two white girls with short brown hair in the same group? To a little kid, these are just the same girl with different haircuts. Their clothes are also much more generic now. Polly tells everyone that her dad is opening up the world's first six-star hotel and that their band is booked to play the opening party, along with a pop star named Eric Wilder. Eric Wilder, I guess. Beth overhears this and she is not the type to allow a petty bit moment to pass her by. Polly gets picked up by Samuel and in a moment that has permanently affected my brain chemistry, activates helicopter mode on the car in order to skip a traffic jam. I can't even tell you how many times I've been stuck in traffic, just yearning for helicopter mode. This was made worse by the fact that I had the helicopter toy, and so my young life was just filled with frustration about the fact that this didn't exist. We're not gonna let a little traffic jam get in our way, are we, Ass Man? His nickname is Ass Man, I don't know what to tell you. Polly's cousin Pia and her chaperone Miss Throckmorton arrive at the hotel first, followed by Polly and Samuel. If there's anything you need, I'm at your service, Polly. Pia shows up to the penthouse before Polly does, and all of her friends confuse her for Polly because they're identical cousins, I guess. Lila then proceeds to give you deja vu if you've seen the first movie. Love the shirt! Love the purse! The whole ensemble, Polly! Loving, Loving it. it! And then Polly walks in and everybody figures out that they're two different people. Anyways, now we begin the most glorious montage in cinematic history. Rocky who? My scene cameo! This hotel is truly the bougiest thing in the world. There's a tropical resort somehow, there's a fully decked out gym, a nail salon, and my god, the food wall! I think the food wall might actually be a reality in some places now, that doesn't seem too far-fetched. It kills me that they horf it down like monsters. My scene cameo! Polly's dad calls, he's stuck at the airport and can't be there this weekend. Another instance of emotionally and physically absent Mr. Pocket. This means that Polly is going to have to give the inauguration speech as well as perform in the concert afterwards. The girls decide to introduce Pia to the band after hearing about her rock star dreams, but there's one problem. Her caretaker will not allow it. Polly schemes a bit and devises a plan where they swap places for the night, with Pia performing in Polly's place. So they're doing the parent trap, pretty much. Except instead of being identical twins, they're just inexplicably identical cousins. Oh wait, holy shit, this is pretty much just the wacky wardrobe game. Ta -da! Ta -da! Ta -da! Finally, they dye her hair blonde to make her indistinguishable from Polly. Another problem, she's only good at violin, which the other girls deem inappropriate for their rock band. And she also sucks horribly at every other thing she tries. Uh-oh, Pia's been busted practicing with the band, but Polly swoops in and convinces Mrs. Throckmorton of the ruse and gets her to lay off. Cut to Beth, Tori, and Evie. While the other two sing the praises of Pocket Plaza, Beth seethes and says that she's seen better. Beth, who is totally not obsessed with Polly Pocket, catches sight of Pia, who she mistakes for Polly, and immediately enters stalker mode. She uncovers that something shady is afoot by eavesdropping on their conversation and vows to uncover the lie and use it to ruin Polly Pocket. They speculate that the lie is that Polly can't actually sing when they spot Pia again, who's singing tunelessly, unaware of her volume due to wearing earbuds. Miss Throckmorton almost catches her again, but she fakes an American accent and points her in the direction of Polly. 
Polly has two bad misses in a row when she calls herself a klutz, which is a mischaracterization of Pia, and when she doesn't know that 4 o'clock is tea time. Pia saves her from her repeat fondling by switching places behind her. I guess Miss Throckmorton is just a little too tuned out to notice that she's wearing a completely different outfit now? Polly's stumped on writing her speech. I relate to you on that one, Polly. Pia offers to help and later as she's leaving, bumps directly into Beth. Beth greets her vaguely and Pia treats them like strangers. But it turns out that they really didn't need this deduction strategy because they just stole her passport. She misinterprets Pia Pocket as Polly's real name and extrapolates from this that Polly has been living a lie. She then breaks into this rant. I knew it! Nobody can be that popular and pretty and talented and nice without something being wrong with her! I knew it! I knew it! I knew it! I knew it! Cherished Twitter mutual Cammy, also known as Darling Dolls on YouTube, tweeted this in response to me posting a clip of Beth. When I was seven, I had a crush on a girl in my class, and I didn't know how to deal with it, so I just wrote her a letter that said, get out of my school. Yeah, that's Beth. Go check out their channel. They also made a video about Polly Pocket that's much more of a concise history than whatever this is. Beth's misunderstanding is quickly cleared up when Pia and Polly appear at the same time, and when Pia gives some very conveniently expositional dialogue as she's passing by. Beth comes up with a new scheme. Prevent Polly from being present at the concert, which will cause the tone-deaf Pia to have to fill in for her. I think this is just another dumb assumption from Beth, because I feel like they would either play instrumental, use a voice track and have Pia lip-sync, or just not open for the show. Polly and Pia prepare a speech together and whoop! This montage wasn't interesting enough, time to go skiing! This place literally contains an entire snow globe world! Beth loudly announces that she's excited to see Polly in the Pocket's newest member, Pia, right in front of Miss Throckmorton. This successfully makes her enraged. She grabs the first person who resembles Pia, which happens to be Polly. Polly attempts to feed Pia her speech through an earpiece, but gets interrupted by Miss Throckmorton, causing her to say the wrong sentence. He asked me to get your Daria up to the room immediately. <gasps> she fumbles with improvising for a moment, but then calms down and gives a passable dedication speech that definitely feels a lot more moving when you're a kid. Polly rushes to the concert venue and thanks Pia for doing her a solid. That was cool. Too cool. At the Pocket Plaza! Miss Throckmorton follows and apologizes for not allowing Pia to pursue her dreams. The last sequence of the movie is Polly's band performing a song called Work the Angles, which is a quintuple platinum single to me. Pia gets to use her violin after all, Beth is mad that her plan didn't work out again, and that ends Too Cool at the Pocket Plaza. This will probably always be my personal favorite by virtue of it being the one I had a DVD for. I still really like the animation style they use here. There's a lot of individually drawn frames and dynamic movements, and even though I think pretty much everyone except Polly has stronger designs than the first movie, this one probably wins out of the three for animation quality. Next up, Polly World. Since this one's an actual movie and not just a 22 minute episode, we get a universal title card before anything else. We get an intro sequence set to the song Welcome to My World, because would it be 2000's Polly Pocket without some tasteful pop rock? The movie opens on the Polly Squad having a sleepover. They're watching some kind of competition show where a bunch of girls whack each other with oars and then fall off a log. They learn as the show is being broadcasted that it's coming to a new local amusement park, Polly World, and their whole class is invited to participate in the show. Polly Pocket is an absolutely shameless Nepo baby. Cut to class the next day where the teacher is explaining some things about their future trip. Beth is angry about the general state of things as usual, including the fact that she has to go on this trip with Polly and that there's no Beth world. Wait, why is this place called Polly World? Is Polly Pocket really a big enough of a celebrity in this universe that it would make sense to brand a whole theme park after her a la Dollywood? Wait, I know the answer to that, and it's no! Polly's just popular at school, nobody treats her like a celebrity, she's not famous. I guess this is just another part of Mr. Pocket's ploy to make up for his total absence in her life. Anyways, back to the Beth crew. Beth postures that she's super excited to go with her own four best friends, Tori, Evie, and two random Swedish kids that she stole. Polly responds politely as usual, which sets off Beth. We get another stealth product placement with this fashion limo, which represents the Polly World limo scene, complete with changing room. Hey, it's Rochelle! The competition begins. Everybody gets a PDA, which has all the functionality of a smartphone. The teams are Team Polly, Team Thrash, Team Lightning, Team Twister, and Team Beth. We get our first look at Polly World. 
For some reason, I was never as impressed by this place as Pocket Plaza. I think it's probably both because I didn't grow up going to amusement parks and I'm too afraid of heights to be able to enjoy them, so this just didn't click for me as effective wish fulfillment. We finally get to see the face of Mr. Pocket. He's attempting to gently break the news that he's planning to get married to this woman, Lorelei, but she busts in and catches her off guard by presuming that she's already been caught up. This all seemed more normal a decade ago, but the fact that he's introducing his fiance to his daughter on the same day that he's breaking the news to her that they're getting married? That's insane! <laughs> this girl is literally a child and her father is so uninvolved in her life that he literally developed a relationship to a degree that he was comfortable marrying her without Polly ever knowing? At this point, it feels like all these gifts and gestures of generosity for Polly and her friends are just to make up for his gigantic pit of guilt. And you can tell Polly isn't unaffected by this. This is the saddest we've seen her ever. Polly reconvenes with her friends to eat Popsicle brand popsicles and break the news to them. Her friends are extremely unsympathetic to her apprehension about Lorelei. They assume since she bought Polly a bracelet that she'll be a generous gifter and are excited about the prospect of attending a pocket wedding. So much so that they're eager to shoot down any concerns that Polly has. I'm sorry, but this movie kind of undermines the entire Polly Pocket fantasy. Polly Pocket's family life just sucks, and Aspen isn't a replacement for loving parents. And her friends are so blinded by greed that... Do they even like Polly? If they stopped liking her, would they just stick around anyways to benefit from all of her gifts and connections? This scene is kind of giving me the impression that that's exactly the case, and that's... That's a bummer! It's just depressing! At least Shiny speaks up and is the only one of the group to actually consider the implications it would have on Polly's life if her stepmom was a bad person, and so the rest of them agree to scope her out. First competition is a hula dance battle, referred to here as a hula doula, which sounds more like the object of the competition is helping somebody give birth. They all do a bunch of dances that don't resemble hula, and it doesn't matter anyways because it's just an endurance contest. Later on, Beth hears Lorelai ranting to her friend on the phone, and Lorelai is 100% the kind of woman who would feel threatened by her man giving attention to his literal daughter. And this automatically qualifies her as a girl failure. Beth, hoping to become her girl failure apprentice, approaches her and proposes that the two of them work together to take down Polly Pocket. Lorelai attempts to say, get lost, kid, but Beth threatens her with blackmail, and so they become collaborators. Lorelai takes Team Polly out shopping, which only further increases their loyalty to her, but Polly only gets more and more concerned. To get her mind off things, they go skating, which brings us this excellent shot of this dude flying into space. Okay, Lorelai might be evil, but this outfit does rule. Her voice actor is honestly pretty great too. Every time she's being kind to Polly, you can just hear the insincerity dripping from her voice, and it honestly makes her a really unsettling presence. She's such an antagonistic force in this movie that, again, I feel like it undermines the Polly Pocket fantasy. Usually, having a meaningful conflict works in a narrative's favor, but I honestly kind of prefer the low stakes, worst case scenario is somebody gets grounded type stories. And that's because Polly Pocket is all about wish fulfillment. Beth doesn't actually hold any real power over Polly, and so when they fight, it feels more like they're on level playing fields and that there isn't an existential threat posed to Polly. But in this movie, the worst case scenario is Polly's already broken family gets permanently ruined, she's separated from all of her friends and loved ones, and shipped off to a potentially abusive institution in which she cannot leave. Like, I don't want to be Polly or one of her friends in this scenario, and that's like the entire point of Polly Pocket. Can you tell this is my least favorite of the Polly Pocket movies? And whew, we're only halfway through. Let's keep going. The group strategizes that the best way to throw Beth off of her game is to stage a fake fight between Polly and the rest of the team. This would make Beth so giddy that she won't be able to focus on doing a good job. On the next challenge, they have to use logs to cross a river, leave a stuffed animal on the other side, and then cross back. Lorelai posits to Mr. Pocket that Polly's jet set lifestyle is causing too much stress, suggesting that maybe she needs a more controlled and regimented environment, setting the foundation for her to later suggest that she go to boarding school. Beth completely falls for Polly's fake argument strategy. Even though Lorelai was at the table with them, she has absolutely no loyalty to Beth and instead uses this moment to convince Mr. Pocket that she's acting out. 
Beth starts to rant to Polly's friends about her hatred for her. Like we really believe she's that nice. And even if she is, what kind of person likes everyone? I don't like everyone. I don't even like anyone. And continues to be the best character. In all of these movies, if there's ever a point where I'm laughing out loud, it's always Beth. <laughs> Delusional queen. Team Polly wins a spa day at Polly World, which honestly seems like something she didn't need to win because she has free access to everything here anyways. Polly gets caught by her dad as she's leaving to go buy him a present, and gives him an extremely deflective answer that just makes him more suspicious. This makes him all the more susceptible to the suggestion of Lorelai, who now insists that she was helped a lot by being sent to boarding school in her youth. Polly says something to Samuel that basically confirms that she sees him as a father figure. Someone you can talk to, who's always there for you. Why would I need her for that? I have you. And Lorelai encounters them and takes notice of this. And so now it's ass man's ass on the chopping block. Lorelai implies to him that the reason Polly won't accept her is that he's taking over all the motherly roles in her life. And I guess this little offhand comment affects him so deeply that he decides he needs to quit right there and now. <sighs> she can't even keep her butler? What's next? Is her dad going to be exposed for the incalculable amount of crime that he definitely uses to keep himself so rich and then Polly ends up a destitute orphan on the street? Polly, Polly. This is honestly the conflict that hurts the worst in this movie because Samuel is the only adult who is consistently physically and emotionally present in Polly's life and not just throwing money at her in hopes that everybody else around her will fill the void. No matter the outcome here, this is going to be a traumatic weekend for Polly. Even if you don't follow through, if you credibly threaten to separate a tween from all of her loved ones, you're going to be giving her some abandonment and trust issues. Polly is going to be talking about the events of Polly World the movie in therapy for years to come. I can't believe you're actually gonna leave us. F you, Chrissy, as if she had any choice in the matter. Polly talks herself out of being sad and they start the next part of the competition, which is a list of activities to complete for a scavenger hunt. We finally get this movie's big montage. They pretty much just go on a bunch of rides. Unfortunately, it just doesn't compete with a food wall. Team Thrash wins this competition. Tomorrow is a talent show with a celebrity guest. Beth intends to make the celebrity guest her new best friend. And you know what a celebrity best friend will make me? An anonymous source for gossip magazines? Sorry, did I say Beth was the best character? Because it's really all three of them. Team Beth guesses that none of the other teams will have a chance so long as Polly and the Pockets are performing, so she starts scheming a plan to take them out of the competition entirely. Shawnee notices that they accidentally got video footage of Lorelai and Beth talking and incriminating themselves, and Polly plans to show her dad. One problem, they need to get him on his own so Lorelai doesn't start manipulating the situation again, and she is clinging to his arm. Oh, thank you. For everything. For making this past year the best of my life. They've been together for a year. A year. She met his daughter days ago. Mr. Pocket is a bad person. And apparently his name is John. After seeing them together, Polly reconsiders exposing her because it'll ruin her dad's happiness. And like, babe, she's a snake. It's going to happen sooner or later, and it's better off if it happened before she collects 50% of his assets in the divorce. But no, she destroys the CD. Band rehearsal montage. I love these pop rock interstitials. Beth reveals that she sabotaged the trap doors on the stage so that they'll fall through when they start trying to rehearse, which sounds like attempted murder to me. <laughs> Ever wonder what you could accomplish if you used your skills for good and not evil? Not so much, no. <laughs> oh, Beth, I could never stay mad at you. Well, at least there's a slide there, for some reason. Team Polly is trapped under the stage, and screaming for help won't work because there's already a screaming crowd in the audience. Beth sabotages Team Thrash's performance by dropping a bunch of kickballs on their stunt routine. The host tries to call Polly in the pockets on stage, but they're still trapped underground. Fortunately, they find a rising platform which magically changes their outfits. Can't you feel it's now or never? And Polly's voice. Beth tries to demand that Lorelai rig the competition and accidentally ends up broadcasting their extremely incriminating conversation, not just to the spectators of the show, but to the entire TV audience. Lorelai storms out in tears after being confronted by John, and Beth tries to make the best of the situation. <laughs> And the winner of the competition is Team Thrash. 
feel nothing about this. That's such a thing in competition stories to make the winner a useless team that nobody was rooting for or against. I think that's such a cop-out. Polly and her dad reconcile and she doesn't have to go to boarding school. Who'd have believed this would turn out to be one of our best weekends ever? Polly! Girl, it wasn't! You were miserable for the majority of this trip, and your scumbag dad just went through an extremely public, messy breakup, which, by the way, completely overshadowed the talent show performance, which you did not win. Polly, this was not a good weekend for you. Beth gives her final seethe before disappearing forever. This is the last time you get everything you want, Polly Pocket. Next time, and there will be a next time, you're going down hard! <laughs> oh my god, what a line delivery. But no, my darling, there will not be a next time. Goodbye, my sweet princess. And that was Polyworld. I admit, I put off watching that movie for days because I just didn't want to. It's so much more emotionally taxing than any Polly Pocket movie has the right to be. And like, it's all resolved in the end, but is it actually? Polly now has to live with the knowledge that her dad is willing to uphold major lies by omission, and he's such a ditz that he can be effortlessly manipulated into ruining her life. And now she just has to continue on with the knowledge that her happiness and freedom is something that can be easily revoked. Here's something that's been weighing on me. How does Polly's dad pay for all of this sh the private island with the empty, fully staffed water park. The most luxurious hotel in the world. The most elaborate amusement park to have ever been constructed. Where does he get the money? Here's what concerns me about John Pocket. It's true that rich people love conspicuous consumption, but what they love more than wasting a ton of money is making tons of money. And with all of his investments that we've seen in the movie, it seems like he's not awfully concerned with making that money back. The closed but fully operational water park is the most obvious example of this, but even the hotel and the theme park, both of these things have amenities that are so resource and time consuming that unless he's pricing these hotel rooms to only be accessible to the 1%, there's no way he's breaking even. And I know some of you are like, Lee, it's a kid's cartoon, nobody's thinking about profit margins and expenses. As if this isn't the Taking Kids Media Too Seriously channel. There's a notable lack of his company or his business. All of his investments are attributed directly to him. This could just be a typical rich person taking credit for everything their business does kind of thing. But I like to interpret this as John Pocket launching all these huge elaborate properties sheerly as a passion project and possibly only in service of impressing his daughter. Maybe he's hoping she doesn't go no contact after his being gone for the majority of her childhood. And perhaps so that he'll have some leverage for her to forgive him when his empire of crime is finally exposed. For God's sake, this man is so withholding from his daughter that he was dating a woman for an entire year before she even learned of her existence. He's treating his fiance like a shameful affair partner. What else is he hiding? Well, there's nothing that we can really be certain of. Of course, Mattel wouldn't directly imply that the father of one of their mascots is funded with dirty money. But I do think a thorough investigation of Pocket Island is in order. The Polyworld DVD had a couple other features. If you load it up to a computer, this interactive page would come up. It includes a little mini game where you can customize a Poly Pocket magazine, which you can then print and assemble, as well as a handful of other downloadables and printables, like some wallpapers, coloring pages, and a Spot the Difference game. The DVD also had a bonus features menu, but since I don't actually own the DVD, I wasn't able to access this. There doesn't seem to be any recorded footage of anything except for the menus. And then we have the reboot that came around 2010. This rebrand for me represents the bitter realization that I was no longer in Mattel's target audience and was therefore going to feel alienated by anything they put out from then on. I'm only going to cover this generation very briefly because I'm just a bit too biased against it to give it a fair chance. Most notably, they changed from the Jerry Livingston designs to... <sighs> They're fine. They're fine. They are objectively fine. Except that I hate it! No, what I was really bent out of shape about was the fact that this replaced the prior Polly Pocket website. The animated media from this generation consists of two seasons of webisodes, one season in a simple flash style and the other in CGI. This is the era where they start to give a bit more consideration to diversity. 
In the web series, especially after the switch to CGI, most of the friend group has a different look. It seems like the designs from the CGI webisodes may have been a bit more diverse than the actual merchandise, kind of like how Lunar Eclipse was to the 2000s era. The actual Polly Pocket dolls during this period seem to have the same heavily pale skin tone range as the previous decade, and Shani still seems to be more rare than the other girls. This is a matter of pure opinion, but I feel a little less biased about it because I didn't have any emotional stock in the doll releases from this time. The face-ups from this rebrand got really, really bad. Her dead, unfocused eyes that seem to end up in a different place on her face every time. This was not a good look for Polly. However, this was changed in 2015 when Polly got a new, much more adorable face. There was an aspect to this time period called cutants, which I consistently read as cut ants. These were animals that were also stuff. I'm sure there's more lore about the cutants out there. I'm hoping there's somebody out there who's younger than me and actually experienced this stuff, who's inspired to make their own video about the 2010s Polly Pocket time period. Cause man, this makes my brain turn off. The brand's profile began to dwindle during this period and eventually shrunk down to only selling in Brazil. Shout out to my Brazilian viewers. That was until 2018 when the most recent rebrand was announced. And that at last brings us to the Polly Pockets that are with us today. I went and checked out a few big box stores to witness the current state of Polly and, well, I think what they're doing nowadays is cool enough. There are definitely a few design trends that are way more appealing to Gen Alpha than to someone like me, such as the decision to make absolutely everything into an animal or food item. Now here's my prediction folks, in about 20 years we're going to see a whole lot of animal and food shaped everything. Couches, tables, kitchen appliances, you name it, because that is going to be nostalgia core for people who are kids right now. Tangent aside, I really like the decision to sell both the miniatures and the fashion polys at the same time. It's just nice to have the option. I feel like I was really lucky to have access to the compact polys as a kid, because not many people my age did. And now kids can more easily have access to either type of play mode. I ended up coming home with two of the miniatures myself because, hey, I was charmed. The first is Shani with an orange cat and a pink cat-shaped car. I kept it in the packaging to show you what that looks like, and I would say it's actually pretty similar to the packaging that I remember from my own childhood. The other one that I got was this, and I was absolutely certain I was going to get this one as soon as I saw it, because just look at the material used to make the body of the scooter. Listen, plastic can be translucent. It can be translucent and pearlescent, or sparkly, or both. And that means it always should be. I want more clear stuff, especially electronics. This scooter comes with a Lila and a tiny itty bitty horse. It seems like the Polly Pocket brand still values making charming little vehicles. And while these aren't quite as impressive to me as the original Polly wheels, I still think they're very charming. What they're doing right now, bringing back the compacts, I think is pretty smart. Like a lot of toys nowadays, they're leaning into the interests of millennial parents which in turn makes those parents more likely to part with their money. It also panders to the interests of collectors, although for the most part, modern Polly isn't really a sought after collector's item. Polly herself is really not at her most iconic in this phase, but it also kind of doesn't matter. They've elevated the side characters so much that it's kind of fine if Polly gets nerfed a bit. The animated media from this generation comes in the form of a TV show starring Polly, Lila, and Shani, and a new guy named Nicholas. Lila is now a redhead in this generation. One thing I've noticed about the discussion of the show is that there seems to be a gay episode. I assume it's subtextual because people would be definitely making a bigger deal out of it if it wasn't, but as a subtext enthusiast, I'm going to need to inspect this for myself. The episode in question is episode 19, Socially Awkward. In this generation, Polly Pocket is no longer unattainably rich. Instead, she has a device which allows her to shrink down to a minuscule size, which I think is a fun way to allude to the dolls, and it's not a bad thing that they switch to a less financially based wish fulfillment angle. The conflict of the story is that Lila has become extremely obsessed with an influencer. After Shiny points out that Lila's been liking all of her photos, including ones from months back, Nicholas suggests that Lila has SMPI, or a social media parasite infection. SMPI. Is that intentional? Is that how they're calling her a simp without using the word simp? They confront Lila about how her obsession is making her neglect the school food drive, and she's in stan mode too much to care. Polly and Shani scheme to get her away from the influencer's party and back to the drive, and they shrink down and follow Lila and the influencer. 
Lila gives a quick speech to thank the people responsible for the party, and I think it's this moment that's responsible for the bisexual allegations. <laughs> I still can't sign off on this as a non-platonic interaction because that was definitely a greeting kiss. Some wacky hijinks ensue, and they end up getting the influencer to help with their food drive. And Nicholas is consistently annoying in every scene that he's in. The end. My official subtext appraisal is that this is extremely tenuous. And if people are using this episode to claim that Lila is bi, I couldn't say that's canon or even really hinted at. This episode is fundamentally about a parasocial obsession, which can happen to somebody regardless of sexuality. I can't even really call this queerbaiting because there just isn't any romantic undertone to their interactions. They really managed to kiss as platonically as possible. And as far as shipping goes, these two would be very creepy as anything other than an unrequited crush on Lila's part. These two are pretty clearly different ages. I know I'm not the target audience here, but there's just something I find much less engaging about this series than the old Polly movies. I personally chalk this up to a few kids animation trends that I find grating. The excessive use of goofy sound effects, the way that all their characters deliver their line like they're in a cheesy community theater performance, general emphasis on wacky action sequences, and the very how do you do fellow kids line choices. I think Lila just unfriended us in real life! Apparently this cartoon had some fun villain characters that were just completely written out of the story, too. And considering that the villain characters and their conflicts with the protagonists are consistently the most entertaining part of animated Polly Pocket media, this seems like a fumble. That's not to say that there's no positive changes here. Shani and Lila feel like characters with their own internal lives instead of Polly's friend, Polly's friend, Polly's friend, and Polly's friend. Drawing attention away from conspicuous consumption fantasies is also a positive. Although I do still love and cherish those montage sequences. Food wall, my beloved. Thanks for bearing with me. I hope to have my next video out a little faster next time. Let me just try to smooth over the fact that I forgot to mention anything at all about my Patreon the first time I recorded this. Three tiers. First, access to an exclusive Discord. Second, access to Patreon-only videos. And third, shoutouts at the end of the video. To be honest, my laptop isn't currently in a state to edit videos at all right now, which is part of why it's taken so long to get this one out. I do intend to replace it soon, and once I do, I'll be doing a Q&A. If you have any questions for me that you'd like to see answered in a video, you can join my $5 per month tier to participate. And a special thank you to... Khan, Fishcatch, Julia, Ms. Goat, Riley Meyer, and Tara Tara. Don't forget to take a look at cool shirts using the link in my description. And if you find something you just can't live without, I insist use code Lee Speaks for 10% off. Okay, bye. I can't do the thing where I fall over because I'm already laying down. <laughs>